Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University of Greenland. Welcome to this probably last public lecture in this spring term. Very glad to see you all. And yeah, it's uh, one day before our national holiday, and we have graduation ceremony this week. So this is what happens when you come to Greenland in the end of June. But nevertheless, glad to see at least a couple of, of faces uh, who have made it. And uh, yeah, very warm welcome to our speaker today, Marine Duc, who has uh, done research on today's topic, written a massive doctoral thesis. I have not read it because it's in French, but I have seen it and it's impressive. And the topic is uh, yeah, student migration between Greenland and Denmark and the formation of dominant positions. And she defended that thesis at the University of Bordeaux, Montaigne, last year, I think? This yeah, year? last November. Last November. And Marine is now working, lecturing, teaching in Paris at the University Gustav Eiffel. Yeah, I don't think I will go on talking because we want to listen to you and your research and your results. But I really would like to express that we really appreciate the possibility of uh, getting some insights in your yeah, substantial research, which not everyone is uh, able to access. So. We're very much looking forward to your lecture tonight, and uh, yeah, I think we will we will see how. Maybe if, if you need a break afterwards, we can have a break. Otherwise, we can also directly go over to some questions and comments that you might have. But now I will pass the word to Marine, and yeah, yeah once again, welcome. Thank you to uh, thank you for coming to hear me and to introduce my PhD thesis. It's a bit strange, but also very satisfying to come back here uh, in Nuuk to introduce the main results. Um, it's also strange because, I mean, coming back here in Nuuk where I started my PhD, it's also, I'm going to speak about yourself <laughs> and also yourself. <laughs> so it's also a bit strange, but um, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming. So. My name is Marie Duc, I'm a geographer and also a sociologist. And I'm currently a temporary lecturer in Gustav Eiffel University. It's like the same name as the guy who made the Eiffel Tower. And uh, I'm interested in the reproduction of inequalities in post-colonial societies. And my focus is on education and especially on higher education. As Eber introduced me, I uh, defended my thesis last November under the supervision of Beatrice Collignon, who is here. <laughs> <She's a> hello. <laughs> and this thesis is a result of five years of uh, research. I carried out between Nuuk, Aarhus, and Copenhagen mainly uh, in order to understand the organization of the Greenlandic student migration uh, to Denmark. And I was interested in how, what are the effects of this migration on the social status of uh, Greenlandic students and persons who are living to, to Denmark. Um, in this presentation, I'm only going to uh, introduce some aspects of my PhD because it's a very big book of 600 pages. We have different you know, uh, norms in France and we are doing largest, uh, larger, sorry, uh, uh, manuscript than in other countries. So I'll just pick up two um, uh, main aspects of my research. Um, I will introduce a bit my methodology first and how I design my research question. question. Uh, then in a second, sorry, I forgot I have this beautiful thing. And then I will give you a glimpse of these trajectories of, of migration uh, the indirection of Denmark, and then the last time will be dedicated on 
how the migration is changing the students who are leaving to, to, to Denmark to study. So I started to work uh, in uh, Greenland m some years ago during my master's thesis. And I was interested first in um, what happened around the mining in South Greenland, especially in Narsak. And during, this, uh, during my stay in Nook, I met several activists who said to me, um, we, have, we have young people coming back from Denmark, and these young people, they are going to change Greenland. They are going to understand what is going on with this mining situation here. And um, I noticed that people have great admiration for the students who are leaving to, to Denmark, and also great expectations uh, for them. And um, I was wondering, like, why? Why it is so, um, why studying it was perceived as so exceptional in this country, in Greenland? And also my other, the other curiosity I had was why the students were seen as the future of Greenland? Because, I mean, you also have a lot of other people here, young people who are not studying, and they are also the future of Greenland. So that was too um, curiosity for me. So I decided to work, uh, I finished my master's degree, and then I decided to build up my thesis uh, project about this um, student migration to Denmark. So my first question was, why uh, people are leaving to study in Denmark? And so what are the motivations to move to Denmark? Uh, because of course you have Elisa Matusafik here and a lot of programs, so why do you leave? And what happens, um, what happens during this experience uh, in Denmark, which can lead for several years, um, like f maybe from six months, and sometimes uh, it can be 10 years. So it's, it's a very uh, diverse situation you can have. So I've decided to finally focus on this articulation between student migration and social status, because it's, uh, well, it's, it, it's, also because of my background, my academic background, but I was thinking it, it's a good way to uh, have a look on this, um, in, on this migration. So in the literature uh, about student migration, this type of migration is often perceived as a privileged one because um, it's a migration between a different um, type of selection process. Of course, an economic uh, selection process because you need money to go outside Greenland to study, but also a s um, more educational selection because in Greenland, one of, my, uh, one of the people, people I met told me that when you are in gymnasium in Greenland, you are yet a part of the elite uh, because only 60, well, 60% 60 of the population of Greenland is, uh, as a level of education, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English properly, but like they don't go beyond um, uh, compulsory education. So in the Greenland context, uh, because of the weight of the structures inherited from colonization, this idea that uh, student migration is a privilege is, has to be complexified because first, uh, the colonial structures are expressed in the interactions uh, during the student migration, you, a lot of students experienced discrimination, stigmatization, but also more on a structural level. Uh, the colonial legacies, they are here, and you can see them very much, uh, of course, in the continuities between institutions, because it allows students to leave kind of easily on an administrative point of view, but it's also a way um, uh, these legacies of colonization are expressed directly on the educational system because the school, the institution, is, uh, values certain types of knowledges, especially uh, doing in languages such as Danish. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm learning anything to anyone here, but that's the main uh, uh, forces, I would say. And the further one pro uh, progresses in the school system, the more dominant Danish becomes. So it leads to uh, a bias 
in favors of Danish speakers in, in the world educational system. And this uh, cultural arbitrary, I'm going here to take back, uh, to take the concept of, uh, of Bourdieu to speak about this, is always adjusted to the interests of dominant groups. And in the Rigsfeld scheme, dominant groups are often the Danish speakers. So it was interesting for me to see a bit more uh, who is uh, privileged in this migration and how this privilege is made during the migration. Oh. So uh, just um, I'm just going to uh, precise some concept I'm, I'm going to use in this presentation uh, because I'm going to speak a lot about race relations. And I know it's a difficult topic sometimes to speak about race because you know of the memory of Second World War. Um, it's not racist to speak about race. It's a concept as social class, as gender. So when I say a white person, it's not an insult, it's not a racist term. It's just a way to speak about people who benefit from racist system. I am white, so I have some benefits in society, like uh, not being called by the police in the street or stuff like that. But um, the being white is also uh, an advantage in educational system because you can access easily to education because you are speaking the language, for instance, of, uh, of the school who is made uh, for uh, this type of, of, of person. So when I speak about whiteness, about being white, it's not only a question of color, of skin color, it's also a question of the knowledge you, are, you have and how the system is valuing what you are. So um, when I speak about race, here uh, we have to get to, to have in mind that race is a social construct and uh, it's, it has been like this since many years now, since the anthropology of, uh, of uh, bars, for instance. And um, to emphasize this socially constructed dimension, I will sometimes speak of race relation instead of just race, because I mean, it's a way to, to, uh, to emphasize this, this uh, constructed dimension. And, and, <coughs> and sorry. And, when we speak about race, it's important to have in mind that it's not a binary situation. It's not the whites against, you know, colored or against Inuit or against uh, other type of minorities. It's a very m m a more complex, uh, a much more complex situation. So, we, so it's very important to think this race in terms of, of a relation and something that is uh, crossing other parameters such as gender and social class. So. Um, my idea for this PhD was to take into account this uh, parameter of race and also the parameter of class when we are speaking about privilege. So um, how, I do, how, how I did my PhD, um, during the six years, five years of my PhD, I spent almost nine months uh, in, in, in total between Nuuk, Aarhus and Copenhagen. And my research is inspired by, by what uh, Marcus called the multi-situated ethnography, which is a, a process where you are going to follow the students or the objects you are, uh, you are studying. So that's why I have been in Nuuk first, and then in Copenhagen, and then in Aarhus. And um, I used mixed method of research, but mainly qualitative methods. Like I've done some semi-directive interviews with public actors in Greenland here, but also in, in Denmark, trying to understand how the um, academic uh, structures are and how, um, how the migration is uh, framed by uh, these institutions. I also used a lot of biographical interviews and trying to analyze the, uh, the structures of them by the, with that type of, of uh, graph that can help to rebuild uh, from the discourses, the trajectories of some students. And I have also used a lot of participant observation with the students, especially in Copenhagen, um, with inside the Greenlandic House of Copenhagen, 
because I was involved in uh, benevolent activities and, uh, and volunteering um, among students. My work is very much influenced by uh, feminist and postcolonial research. So also um, my work is also influenced by some indigenous scholars. So I think it's very important for me, especially coming here in Nook, to acknowledge that I've conducted this research with a specific point of view because you know I'm white I've, and I'm also educated, so I think it has consequences on what I can see and what I can understand from the students and from the interviews. But um, I think also from experience that some students uh, wasn't that uh, comfortable to share a lot of experiences with me sometimes. But um, it's also important for me to say to you that I know by, by experience what oppression is because I'm a woman, I'm also pansexual, so it's, you know, we, we share some of um, way to be oppressed. Of course, not the same that the Greenlandic student have met, but still it is uh, something. So um, that um, methodology part said, I'm going to to go directly to my second part, uh, to the second part of this presentation and giving you a glimpse of the trajectories of the students. Um, the ones who are going to Denmark are a very uh, heterog heterogeneous group. It's about 420 students. It depends on uh, the numbers of Greenlandic houses. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, to know exactly how many are they because um, it depends on what a Greenlandic student is, of course. If you are going to use a specific agreement between Greenland and Denmark to go to higher education, it's not the same numbers, of course, that if you are just taking into account the people who are coming from Greenland. So, yeah, we, are, um, we agreed uh, that we have around 420, around 400 people who are going to study in higher education in Denmark. And as I said, uh, this is a very heterogeneous group. And um, even in this, uh, in this group, it's very interesting to, to qualify a bit this privileged uh, migration because we have in this uh, migration uh, um, a lot of unexpected trajectories. Uh, it means that these trajectories defy the odds uh, in a way because if we just have a look at the sociological profile of the students, we can easily say that um, those who leave, they have little chance of succeeding uh, in higher education in Denmark. And that's how they are presented in Denmark. They are very much perceived as a risk student, risk of dropout, risk of not going well uh, into um, universities, and they are very much looked uh, like this. But if we just have a look on the numbers, um, we have very old now numbers about the, this dropout situation. Um, in 2015, the numbers uh, were 27% of Greenlanders are dropping out in first year against 15% uh, of Danes. But if we just have a look closer, uh, we have a lot of differences, especially between towns. Uh, in Copenhagen, for instance, well, the numbers are, a bit, uh, are for a bit after, but in Copenhagen, you only have like 16% of, of dropouts. And in Odense, it's a bit more. So we also have a lot of differences between cities. So the world situation of the Greenlandic students in Denmark is uh, looked as a problem uh, of a risk of dropout. But if you just have a look at the number, it's a bit more complex. Um, this, uh, this, this 400 students, they are going, um, who are going to Denmark. Uh, it's, they are very much uh, um, spread uh, in Denmark between the four cities, Aarhus, Copenhagen, Olbor, and Odense. And um, they are mainly going to choose one type of education, uh, which is so vocational education, uh, vocational bachelor degree education especially. And this trend is the same in Denmark. So w we can see the popularity of this, of this educational program here 
that the same for Greenlandic students and, and Danish students. Also, uh, between 2016 and 2020, we have seen a decrease in, in the students going to Denmark, but that's just, uh, uh, it, it's not, it, well, I mean, it's not a problem in a way because uh, we have a lot of, of new programs here in Helicimatosophic, so I guess a lot of students are staying here. Also, the demographic situation in Greenland is just decreasing as well, so it can also explain this decrease. But it doesn't mean that on, um, in a year you have less students who are going to take an education. Um, also, we can say that the most popular uh, courses program are structured uh, around uh, three areas. The first, the most popular area chosen uh, by Greenlandic students is administration and management, like uh, uh, banking, law, management in, in, in businesses. The second uh, area is care and uh, health studies, such as medicine or vet education, veterinarian education. And uh, the third uh, most popular uh, group of education is engineering, uh, mechanics, and construction building. So the one who are living now, uh, according to gender, it's mainly female. Um, women tend to be the one who live most, uh, like you have two and a half times more women uh, than men and world in Denmark. And it's a bit uh, it's it's a bit different than in, in Greenland. You have m uh, a bit less uh, women who are going to Denmark than women who are taking an education in Greenland. If you just have a look on on this uh, uh, relation, and if you have a look on this uh, here, this figure, uh, in terms of age, Greenlandic students also uh, tends to be a bit older than in 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 Denmark, and. It was a bit a funny question when I was there because I was 28, which is, which can be seen as pretty young uh, to be a PhD student compared to uh, Greenlandic or the Danish situation. But uh, especially in France, we are younger than in Denmark and, and, and than in Greenland. So if we just have a look uh, on the figure, if you, if you have a look on, on the bachelor program, for instance, we have one or two years of difference between uh, students coming from Greenland and students coming uh, and, stu and, and Danish students. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So that's that's a global uh, view we can have uh, of education. I just wanted to say that we don't have public data about uh, the social origin of Greenlandic students. So I think it's also very hard to try to say, to analyze the uh, inequalities in education, because if you don't have data, aggregated data about this, uh, we, we cannot say precisely where they are coming from uh, and where uh, they are going into society. So uh, we can have some idea with the age uh, that can be a proxy to estimate the condition of, of studying, but it's not exactly the same. So um, many Greenlandic students are the first of the families to, to go to, to higher education. Uh, just to get you an idea, over the four, 46 students I've met, um, I had 15 uh, who were the first of the families to, ha to go beyond uh, compulsory education. So it's, it's very much, for me it was very uh, strange in a way, in, in a good way I mean, but uh, compared to what I know from France, it's a very different situation. But we also have a lot of students who have parents with very good situation, who are CEOs in Nuuk, or who are living around the world, and uh, yeah, so it's a very diverse group. Um, this uh, heterogeneity of the group is also very much seen in where they are going. Uh, in this figure, you can see that uh, the students in Copenhagen are very much coming from Nuuk, and uh, if you just have a, uh, if you if you compare with who is going to study in Nuuk, you have much more students coming from other places. So it's like you have a very strong link between big cities in in Greenland and and big cities and big and prestigious university in 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 Denmark. Um, just to be said that Copenhagen and Aarhus are the most chosen destinations uh, for by Greenlandic students. 
So, uh, so let's just have a look on uh, where they are going more precisely. Uh, on this map, you can see that <coughs> Greenlandic uh, students' numbers are very different from one city to one another. And you can just see on, uh, on the left of the picture that Copenhagen and Aarhus are the most chosen uh, destination, also because you have much more uh, institutions here, uh, of course, because it, they are just bigger town. So um, it's very hard, it's also very hard to get, you know, aggregated data about students because of the small numbers in Greenland. So we have like a, an anonymity issue, I would say, uh, because if you are coming from a a, a small village and you are the only one of the village to take an education in Olbau University, like you will not be anonymous anymore. So that's the only, uh, I would say, like synthetic map I could make in my whole PhD because it's too complicated to get um, precise data about that. I just wanted to say a word about uh, Roskilde University. Roskilde University is a very specific case because uh, in the sociology and literature in Denmark, you can, it's, it's very well known that Roskilde University is, of course, a very leftist university by history, but also a university where a lot of students with a lot of cultural capital are going because you have a mainly like 90% of the research of the educational programs are in social sciences. And it's a very um, hot, how can I say that? Like it's a very, uh, it's a very famous place for uh, social reproduction in a way. And the interesting thing is that if you have a look on the Greenlandic students who are going to Roskilde, you will have mainly students coming from Nuuk. Uh, so it's a, uh, you can see in the blue, and also students coming from outside Greenland, meaning that their address, uh, the, regi the registered address was probably in Denmark before they came to study. So you can say that Roskilde, as for Greenland students, is the same trend that we can see in Denmark. Of course, it's not that precise because, as I said, we don't have like uh, um, precise data about the parents' jobs of the students who are going, but just by uh, the origin, we can have some estimation uh, of the social uh, origin of the students because Nuke is known to be uh, richer and also uh, with a lot of people with a lot of cultural capital and speaking Danish and all of that. So um, two ideas are important to, to get in mind when we describe the trajectories of the students. Um, first, there is a lot of unexpected trajectories, like a lot of social breakers, as I've said before. And at the same time, we have also a lot of trajectories that express uh, profound inequalities in front of education. So in my work, I hypothesis that the importance of these unexpected trajectories can be explained by first the material uh, framework around the students, like the ESU, but also a lot of uh, the Greenlandic Houses Network, a lot of loans that, can ha that they can uh, get when they are going to study. And also uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, amount of, of social breakers can be um, explained by uh, what I call the moral framework. I mean uh, by that uh, uh, a sort of a vocational sense of education that is made uh, very soon in the trajectories uh, among the students. So I'm going to speak a bit about uh, about this uh, this idea. Um, this it, it's a very special relationship to education uh, uh, that the students built over time, and um, my idea is that it it takes uh, the root in a very positive self-esteem uh, among the students, and this uh, self-esteem fuels. Uh, uh, the ambition of those who are living to study in Greenland. And the, this, this relationship to study is like a driving force because the students sometimes feel uh, feels, that they are, uh, they are going to save Greenland, they are going to get an education, and as, I, as you can see on, on this uh, small uh, interview, that they are going to lift the land. 
and, and it, it's an idea that is very much um, here when you are speaking with the students in, in Denmark. This, uh, vocational, edu uh, this voca vocational sorry, sense of education, uh, it has three aspects, three characteristics. The first one is a personal attachment, like a feeling of being made for, uh, for education. Or sometimes the, sp the students speak about a, a mission, that they have to complete a mission. Like you can, in this, uh, in this extract, you can see that uh, these students had the sense of doing education for the, co for the country. Like if like, education wasn't like a personal objective, but more like a collective objective. Uh, the second characteristic you can see in this uh, vocational sense of education, it's a very intense investment uh, in, in education. And this intense investment can also lead to difficulties in saying when times are hard and when um, you aren't going well. So sometimes it's even not the students themselves that they are going to say when they are not going well. It's more like com comrades or family sometimes that are going to say to the students, please just, you know, uh, take your time. It's not, it doesn't matter if you don't succeed, just take your time. And the third, uh, uh, third characteristic in this uh, vocational sense of education, it's like it's more uh, uh, a sense of uh, a calling of being unique in a way, or, uh, or the idea to live a very sp to live a very specific experience that the one who are not uh, uh, living to study in Denmark aren't uh, sh uh, are not sharing. And this uh, this idea of uh, this this, sen this vocational sense of education, uh, it's also a very uh, incorporated in in the even in the bodies of of the students because sometimes it can translate in a lot of stress or anxiety to to lose or to the, the yeah to be scared of of the failure. Like a student told me once that. Um, if she failed, it was all of Greenland that was failing. So it's a pretty much hard situation for them sometimes. But this sense of vocation is, is uh, also very differently distributed among the students. Um, I've noticed that uh, it's more pronounced among uh, the students from working class and also from uh, middle class background, uh, especially among the students who are coming from a um, family close to education, like uh, families, like if you have a parent who, who is a school teacher, for example, uh, you have more chance to, to have this, this sense of, of, uh, of uh, vo this vocational sense of education and this sense to, that you are going to save Greenland by taking an education. Um, I guess that these students, like coming from a different social background, um, they have they have this vocational sense of education because entry in higher education was the culmination of a very long uh, um, um, and selective, of course, uh, uh, path. Also, because they are more dependent in a way uh, of the institution. Of, of, of school, um, I think that they are more likely to recognize that school is a legitimate way to succeed in society. So uh, I guess that's the thing that, we, that can explain uh, this vocational sense of education. And in addition to this uh, vocational relation with studies, there is also different elements that can contribute to build this moral sense of taking an education. Uh, the first one is uh, the institutional framework between Greenland and Denmark, uh, and especially the framework built by the special agreement between Greenland and Denmark that can uh, allow some students to take an education more easily um, according to the grades. Maybe we can go back to this uh, a bit later. And this, uh, this special agreement, to, in my point of view, um, facilitates uh, the non-integration of the school constraints, like 
uh, if you can see in this, in this, uh, some in the short extract of my fieldwork notes, I was in a, I was in an event uh, at Avalac, and we were playing cards. And one of the guy called Emil here on the on the extract uh, was uh, just um, explaining how he came to to a very selective program in psychology in Copenhagen University. And he said to the people around the table that he hadn't the 12 average uh, which is needed to come into this program. And uh, he was just uh, saying that uh, it was complicated for him to just be in the room with all of these students, you know, very, with a very high average. And it wasn't like this. So we can see here that this seroning uh, is just changing the way you, you are, you are uh, appreciating, I would say, the constraint, the school constraint in a program. And the other uh, um, element that is contributing to build this moral sense of education uh, is the importance of what uh, a French sociologist called Lagrave is calling the climbing allies. And uh, I think it's a very nice uh, metaphors, metaphor, sorry. So this, this climbing allies, they are people who are going to help the students uh, during their pass, like, I don't know, like a specific teacher, or sometimes it's also just friends or organization, like Avalac. You can see here some pictures from uh, events in Avalac where we were going to play during evenings or also playing games or just look uh, on the TV. And uh, these can be allies. Uh, they are going to help the students to build their own self-confidence and also to um, sometimes also to, uh, there, are, there are resources for the students, like they are going to check an essay or things like that. So these elements, uh, they are going to influence the students' representation of themselves, and also they are going to influence uh, the courses they find desirable for them. Uh, generally speaking, in, in, in the research of Bourdieu, you can see that the students are going to, to uh, exclude some uh, programs because they, are going to, they, they, they think that these programs are too uh, selective if they just look at themselves. But in this uh, Greenlandic configuration, what I found is that because of this moral framework around the students, uh, the mental barrier are just going to, uh, are just, uh, how do you say, uh, are just going to, to fall in a way. So a lot of Greenlandic students are going to apply in a very selective program. So it's like a, 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 f a strength for them to come into education. <coughs> and it can explain in my point of view, sorry, in my point of view that you have a lot of students who are going to, to Denmark even though they are uh, coming from a middle class background or a low class background. Uh, so it's not that, it's, it's interesting to see uh, how the privilege is not here anymore in this trajectory. But um, this moral framework is, uh, uh, plays a positive role uh, in, in, in the student's path, but after you can also see during the, the experience of the student that a lot of them are going to change a bit uh, their education during, uh, during their stay in Denmark. Um, among the students I have met, half of them have changed the prog their program to go to something less prestigious or less selective in some ways. So every time a, a student is changing um, uh, a program, it's always in direction of less uh, prestigious education. So you can also see here that um, you can also see here the, the weight of inequalities, I would say, in a more structural dimension. So um, I have shown that uh, it's important to qualify this idea of a privileged migration in paying attention to uh, three elements. Like, first of all, it was a diversity 
of uh, social origins and the role also of, of resources in, in this migration. Yeah, so these uh, resources are the second aspect you need to have in mind when we are speaking about the privileged migration. Uh, and the last one uh, is that we have uh, to take into account the career of the students in higher education because a lot of students are going to take less prestigious or shorter courses when they stay in Denmark. But of course, it doesn't mean that they are not going to finish their education. They are just changing to something they are more comfortable with. So that said, this question of uh, privilege mig in migration um, has to be understood for a more experiential uh, point of view, I would say. We have seen first the structural. Now it's just interesting to go to the uh, more uh, personal or psychological, I would say, point of view. Studying in Denmark um, allows you to acquire a diploma, a degree, of course, but it's also a way to get specific skills that can be valued when you go back to Greenland, uh, especially on the job market, such as uh, speaking Kalashlisut as well as Danish, but also to get some specific skills, like uh, knowing how to plan well your day or uh, knowing how to small talk in, in, in doing meetings, for instance. So when to, have, uh, to, to speak about these uh, embodied, I would say, learnings. Uh, we can we can speak uh, we can speak of processes of socialization, meaning the way you are going to learn things, you are going to internalize some processes, some way of being during your stay in Denmark. Um, what struck me during my research that was migration is not an experience where uh, we just learn; it's an experience where you change. So this change is not only on a psychological level, like the idea of being more mature, the idea of uh, uh, gaining self-confidence, the idea of being more open to the world, that's more on a psychological level. But I showed on my thesis that these transformations of the self um, has to be understood in a more sociological terms, because what happens in this migration is that people learn to be elites in a way, or people to, uh, learn to be um, dominant subjects. Uh, I, I just prefer to, to speak about dominant subject than elite, because elite is just a fraction of uh, the dominant group. So I think it's more uh, relevant to speak about dominant, but that's just a, a small uh, vocabulary um, uh, precision. <coughs> So uh, ju if we just have a look on who is going back home, um, it seems that um, once they come back home, uh, the students are taking conscious of the distance they have made in uh, the social hierarchy uh, when they come back to, to Denmark, because a degree gives you, of course, access to professional positions, and um, especially when they come back home, they are mainly coming back home to bigger city in Greenland, like in Nuuk and in Sisimut, mainly. And for almost all of the students I've met, they have better uh, positions than their own parents. Um, like it could be in the responsibilities they get, like uh, in their own jobs, but it can also be a different type of jobs with more cultural capital needed, or things, uh, things like that. But when, uh, when they come back home, of course, not all of them are going back home. If you just have a look at the numbers here, you can see that um, the students tend to come back home more with the time, like five years after the on graduation, you can see that more than 64% uh, are back in Greenland. It doesn't say where they are going back, but uh, mainly, as I know, it's mainly in Nuuk and in Sisimut. When they come back home, um, some students are seen as having changed uh, very much from their own parents, and but also from their own friends 
and from the community uh, in general. Just, uh, I'm just going to tell a story of a master student in administration. This, uh, this girl was uh, on her way to Tassilac to give a conference about her own job, and she was leaving her hotel in Tassilac. She lost her glove, and the glove just fell in the snow, and she didn't real realize it. And uh, some moment after that, uh, she was chased by uh, kids who called her, like, Kashlunat, Kashlunat. And she doesn't recognize herself uh, at first because, well, she, she doesn't recognize her, herself as a Kashlunat. And it was the same for me because the way she looks and the way she believed in her, her, in her own country, for me, she wasn't, we, we couldn't say that she was a Kashlunat. And um, she eventually understood uh, that uh, it was her, and uh, she was very surprised. And then she doesn't really, uh, yeah, she, she doesn't understand. So she just asked to someone who were here, and uh, the guy said, "But you, you are, you, you look like a cash lunatic because look at your clothes. You have like dark clothes. You also uh, have like a." Uh, yeah, dark clothes and heels also in the snow, so it wasn't very easy for her to work with. And she also work, worked fast. And for this guy, just sitting here, working fast and wearing this type of clothes were perceived as white and was perceived as something the Krashlinet are doing in Greenland especially. And we can see here with this uh, example that the racial categorization, such as Kashunad and, and, and Inuk, sorry, are not exactly the same as just skin color, A shape, what we call phenotypic markers. It's a bit more to be white, to be categorized as white, or to be categorized as an Inuk. And um, we can also see with this example that these categories are not are very in a way, you can change of category with your uh, experience in Denmark. And some ways of behaving are socially coded as more white, and, socially, and, and some other ways of behaving are socially coded as more in, in wit or inuk. So, of course, it is all based on stereotypes, but the way you are perceived is going to change when you come back home. Um, in my in my research, uh, this these changes uh, are very often uh, uh, understood by the students themselves, and uh, they speak um, of these changes in different uh, ways, in different terms. Like they can say sometimes that they have adapted to the general situation in Denmark. That sometimes they also say that uh, they've become they've become a little Danish in a way or that they have a little Danish part in themselves. And these uh, transformations, they are seen as uh, very much necessary to survive in, in the academia in Denmark, because if you are not changing yourself, you cannot you know, be a part of the community of the students, and you cannot you know, uh, be like the other one. Uh, in conc if you just have a look on what what is changing, um, I, I have I've seen some of these uh, changes uh, in clothing, like the way you are going to 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 choose your clothes. Uh, it's usually the students are u usually um, wearing more black when they come back home, and they say that they, they put it that way, like I'm going to to have my dark clothes to go back to Greenland, and then uh, I'm going to be seen sometimes as a Danish one because I have black clothes and all of that. And, uh, but also what is going to change is like the body language, um, walking faster, of course, I have said that before, but also talking faster, talking uh, loudly also is, uh, is uh, very much a change sometimes uh, with uh, more small talks. Um, I have this, uh, this quote uh, in the middle of, this, of, the, of the screen you can see. Um, in this quote, a girl told me that 
she, be she became one of the students who can speak about the type of candy they like. And like six months before, she was much more like, okay, uh, I don't want to take part of this conversation. It's, it doesn't interest me. And after six months in Denmark, he said, oh, okay, I can talk about the type of candy I like for hours, and then I can, you know, just be a part of the community of the student. Another thing that is going to change with this uh, uh, experience in Denmark is the relationship to time. Because when you are going to, to be a student, you learn to manage your time. And especially in Denmark, um, students are, are, are changing the way to to see time because they are going to plan a bit more their own life, uh, especially for meeting friends, but also for some simply studying and managing the different part of their life. So when they come back home, they've seen uh, this, this stereotypized way of being, of acting, uh, are perceived as typically Danish in a way because this changes uh, happened when the students are in Denmark. So we can see with this uh, example that this racial categories like to be perceived as a real Greenlander or to be perceived as typical uh, uh, Danish um, are very much made uh, rather than just, you know, uh, be. They are made in, 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 in action, in daily actions. And it's like uh, this category is it's very much about acting. It's like a script, a role, and um, of course they are made of, of stereotypes, but they have been integrated by the students during the stay. But um, it's important that these uh, changes in the self uh, are not to only are not a change in identity, I would say, and the notion of identity, at least on my point of view, is a very psychological one. So I prefer to not speaking about identity because for me it's very personal and as, as a sociologist, social scientist, it's not my uh, role to go uh, to speak about the identity of the students. But uh, what interests me as a sociologist and a geographer is how the student trip to Denmark will change while well. people are identified in the society and how they are defining themselves as belong as belong uh, as uh, yeah as uh, in society as a member of a group. And um, if some students are perceived as more Danish when they come back home, um, it's also interesting to see that the socialization during uh, this student migration is a way to uh, also work in an opposite direction because it deepens the understanding of um, the minoritized position of the student in the Rigsfeld scheme. Um, they are going to see more this uh, the own position as a product of a history, a specific history and specific structures. So these changes cannot be read as a lost in culture. Um, in fact, it's sometimes and often uh, quite the contrary, I would say, um, because a, numbers or a number of factors are contributing to deepen uh, this, this understanding of, of themselves. Of course, you have the exposure to discrimination, um, but this exposure to discrimination isn't exactly the same for every student. But you also have uh, changes that occurs in the way in what colonization is, I would say. Um, like going to Denmark is a way to taking <coughs> conscious of how Greenland is close to Denmark, but also very different. So a lot of students begin to reflect on what colonization is, like in a daily basis, when they got to Denmark. You also can see this reappropriation of origins uh, in the body of the students. Uh, I have met a lot of students who use tattoo, uh, like Inuit tattoo, as a way to reconnect with their own, uh, own history as a group. 
like you can see on the picture on the center here, um, uh, the harm of the students, he made a tattoo of his grandfather uh, kayaking, for instance. And also some students are going to use their own cultural capital and their proximity, I would say, with a legitimate uh, culture to disseminate knowledge and to uh, turn also into climbing allies uh, at their own uh, uh, turn, I would say, at their own, uh, uh, yeah. So they can go to gymnasium and going to uh, make some guidance for the students. They can get involved in organizations such as Avalak or in Greenlandic houses. But I also have seen some students uh, going to uh, invest a lot of uh, social medias such as uh, Instagram here and to make a work uh, about cultural revitalization. Um, like this one is maybe some of, the, some of you may know her. Uh, she is a, a, a postdoc here, and she's doing a lot of stories in Instagram about um, uh, food colonialism and why we should uh, also eat in Greenland uh, food from Greenland. So uh, if we can, on some aspects, sometimes students, when they come back home in Greenland, they can be perceived as more white, or as whiter than they were before going to Greenland, um, it, you need to take into account that um, this socialization process during the student migration is not working only towards whiteness. It's also, wor it's also working towards um, Inuitness, I would say, or Inukness. So I think it's interesting to have this uh, double perspective in a way. Like students are going to be a part of the group that are dominant in the Greenlandic society, but they are also going to reconnect with on a minoritized condition where they are in Greenland, in, in Denmark, sorry. So I think it's really interesting to have this perspective uh, in mind because um, sometimes uh, assumptions are made about the students who are coming back from, from, uh, from Denmark as students that are not connected anymore with the Greenlandic situation. And I think it's pretty much the opposite um, in what I have seen, at least. So just a few words to conclude, and then we can maybe uh, go to discussion. Um, one of the main results of my thesis uh, is to have shown that this idea of student migration as privilege must be complexified um, around two axes. A first, a vertic uh, the first axis is more vertical, I would say. It's like we need to understand that the social privilege is not always already here, but is more made with the migration itself. And we also have to complexify the migration as privilege on a more horizontal axis, um, more attentive to the different parameters that come into play in this migration to shape the experience of the students and to construct the social status of the student during the migration. So thank you for your time and uh, for welcoming me.